Um, now let's come to the um, last talk of this session. And uh, once again, I'm um, happy to um, introduce uh, yet another um, known face. Um, actually, when um, we were looking for um, someone from Zuke to, to give a presentation here, um, I asked a former Zuke colleague called Stefan Schmidt. He declined. Uh, and, and now we got another yeah. Stefan Schmidt. <laughs> Um, in this case, um, Stefan was um, giving a presentation a couple of years, I think six years ago um, here at the summit on um, JerryScript, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, in the meantime, he's working um, as a um, um, principal solution architect at, at Huawei, and he's going to um, talk about um, the Onero project. Um, Stefan is Yet another, uh, let's say, um, long time open source um, software enthusiast um, working with the Linux kernel and uh, particular as a 815 bit core maintainer um, for quite some time. And that's where we got first in contact. Um, but today he's um, talking about um, the Onero project and I'm quite interested to hear about because um, as far as I understood um, currently, there's a good um, integration of um, Sapphire um, in Onero, and um, maybe that could be also uh, another um, alternative to get uh, right uh, in there. So let's give a warm welcome to, to Stefan, our final talk of uh, speaker of this session. So hello, everybody. Um, as Oleg already introduced me, so my name is Stefan Schmidt. I'm a principal architect uh, in the Open Source Technology Center at Huawei. Um, we have a project we're working on, the Onio project, and I want to give you a little bit of introduction into that. And um, yeah, let's get started. So um, who am I? I mean, Oleg raised a little bit of that. So I'm, I'm a little bit of an old timer. I mean, not that old, but um, started 2005 uh, porting Linux 2.4 to 2.6 on the first uh, Linux mobile phones in Europe. So there have been like Motorola, EVX phones around at that point. The first time I got in touch with that, I was a Linux user at that point for a few years already, but I got really interested in like getting my own stuff running on there, just really like while I doing my studies, really getting like practice and really coding and so on. So I started to like porting over to 2.6. Um, since then, I always dabbled in open source in all kinds of areas, being a bootloader, being a kernel, being a user space libraries, being a whole operating systems and platforms and so on. And my diploma thesis I did on delay tolerant networking over 15.4. So that's like 10 years ago. So don't ask me about delay tolerant networking anymore. But 15.4, I stayed with. So um, I, I'm now one of the co-maintainers of the 15.4 subsystem in the Linux kernel. Um, it's not moving as fast as maybe on the on the Arthur systems or something like that. There's a lot more more interest in that. But on Linux side, we are still doing that. And I mean, obviously the focus is more on like gateway scenarios and so on. Um, I'm also doing various workshops over the last years at NetDev. NetDev is the uh, core Linux um, networking uh, conference in Linux Plumbers. So this year, next week, actually in Dublin, there will be an IoT workshop again about that. And I'm the architect of the connectivity domain in the Onio project. And I was actually a Riot speaker in 2006, so the first one in Berlin, I was there. I, I tried to get my Riot uh, t-shirt again. I don't know, it got missing somehow. I'm, I'm not blaming my wife. I don't know where it went, but uh, it's no longer there. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. So what is the Onio project? So it's an Eclipse Foundation project with a working group and everything. So we have like all the member companies coming. It's a completely vendor neutral members coming in, giving their requirements, and we're working together to like, towards a common goal. And the goal we're having is like having a distributed operating system for consumer devices, big and small. Big and small, really we are going from tiny outdoor systems up to Linux and then maybe even um, cloud and so on, de depending on what the, what the partners really bring in here. And one of the core interests of uh, Huawei in this is bringing like open harmony comp compatibility in here. Don't know how many of you heard about open harmony. I wouldn't expect not too much. So Huawei, uh, Huawei has an operating system called Harmony OS in, in, it's used in China. And there's like the open source foundation of that is Open Harmony. So basically they have a complete foundation there with the whole open source project running there called Open Harmony, but it's not really used in, in Europe anything. And one of the big tasks the um, Open Source Technology Center here in Europe from Huawei has 
is to bring this to uh, to Europe. We are doing that in a different fashion. So it's not like we are just taking what they have and like trying to make it work here and get partners on board and so on. But we did what we did instead. It's like we started out, talked to uh, different potential partners, talked to all kinds of people. We now in the space and understand what the requirements are they have. So what is like what kind of operating system kernel you want to use, what kind of like uh, toolkit you want to have, like what kind of cloud connectivity you want to have, and so on and so on. So we talked about and tried to come up with a, with a sane list of requirements. And that actually um, changed quite a bit of like how we, we took Open Harmony. So instead of like taking the code base as we have it, we decided to start from scratch and we decided to go with, uh, with Linux and we decided to go with Zephyr, and we also decided to go with Yocto as a build system around it, and then all kind of stuff around it. I go into the details a bit more, just to for you to understand how we started out with this. So, but, but what we actually trying to solve here. So as usual, we try to solve technological and eco ecosystem fragmentation. Always, um, almost everybody's trying to use, uh, try to do that, but we also try to, um, go away from the very cloud centric approaches a lot of the, the platforms and ecosystems are doing and try to like find ways to do that in a more user centric way even have like for example in if you have like a smart home or something you do link local communication only you don't need to have a cloud backend to actually do all of that and have all the logic sitting there with the with the ai and so on acting on it but more like having it more more centric to what you want to do and we have uh, cross device content portability the idea here is to have like not obviously you can't go ahead and have your like your huge cute application running on your on your outdoors or something like that easily but you have like business logic you can distribute and so on so this is like the part of the distributed OS. you want to bring that up and make sure that we can like um, share the resources we have have virtual resources throughout the network devices discover each other share the resources and then you can can bring them together and like make really smart decisions in the end i know that all sounds a bit fluffy i come to more more details here Again, we have like a big uh, architecture di diagram here. Um, some of these things are no longer up to date, um, but most of them are. So, um, is there a pointer here? I don't know. Oh, I should have. Um, so you can see down here, you have like, you have, we go with MCUs, we also go with CPUs. So MCUs, we are right now running mostly with Sapphire. We have um, support or ideas for like other systems going in here. This is one of the reasons I'm, I'm here to talking to you. And on the, Linux, on the CPU side, we are going with Linux only. Then um, we have like secure boot solutions already on the Linux side with Opti, TPM and so on, and going with the mainline kernel and so on. Then on top of that, we are running, running Yocto to build everything together and then have different layers for different parts of the operating system here. And you can see here, we have Zephyr that's actually no longer 2.6. We're going with the newer version right now. We started to work on LightOS, which is a popular um, kernel in, in, in China. Uh, but we also have uh, started to look into things like FreeRTOS um, because there is actually a meta FreeRTOS layer. So we can build something in conjunction with, with Yocto here. Um, and then we have a lot of other things wrapped around it. So this is, so as technical people, we look at these, right? That is something, okay, we can understand that the architecture we are building up and so on. That's something we can, we can uh, offer as a solution. But we have been talking to potential partners we have a, there's a lot of more stuff around it, like um, IP compliance, push, uh, policy checks and so on, um, to make sure that everything we deliver and give out is like the license is checked, the files are checked, we're making sure that these kind of things are getting in place. This is really boring for us, but this is something if you want to get out a product or want to get partners on board, that is really interesting for them. And then we, we decided to go with Bitbake as the, as the um, Yocto build tool to bring it all together. Um, you can always go ahead and build something manually with whatever CMake, make, uh, REST or whatever tooling or infrastructure you have around that. And this is really nice if you have like an, uh, a project that is really only this one part, but if you want to go ahead and bring that all together, it's really, really convenient to have like, go ahead and say, I want to build this image. And then the, uh, the things that will fall out of that will be like the, the image for like the, if you take the robot example from Artron, we have been seeing before, right? There would be like the image for the Raspberry Pi falling out. And maybe inside the image, there would actually be the firmware image generated for the controller inside that is running RIOS, uh, iOS, 
And then you can actually from the long sides already baked in there, you can flash that. And from inside the image, you can then again flash the, um, the SDM shipset, for example. So these kind of like integration steps and so on are really interesting. Yeah, and then we have the, the usual thing, right? We have like uh, um, different two chains for GCC, LLVM. We are using, um, yeah, I think it's GCC 12.2 and LLVM 14, I think right now. Um, but this is also constantly updated. And then we have like some certification testing. This is like application certification test suite, which is mostly targeted for open harmony. But we have like in testing, we have like all kinds of other things going on, but I will show about that. I mentioned initially um, the idea of like one pillar of the open harmony system here. So we are like the on your side is very uh, European centric. We are working with the partners around here, trying to understand that. So. For example, if you have like Huawei Cloud, for example, nobody here wants to use that, right? So that is part of the Open Harmony system in China, and that's very well used there. But here, the partners come to us and say they want to use AWS, Google Cloud, or Azure, or whatever. And then we need to find solutions for that makes it possible for them as well. And we are trying to be very production oriented. So we take all the open source. Um, projects that are out there, really work upstream with them, try to solve our own needs and our requirements, but make it in a way that partners can actually build on top of that and really bring out their product. So anywhere, basically. So as I said, we have like, we are using Yocto and Yocto has this idea of having different layers to build things together. Um, for example, the Linux one is obviously the main one. And then you have normally you have BSP layers for all the different major SOCs that are available from NXP, STM, uh, TI, what, what you name it. And then you have like also silicon vendors coming in like ARM, Intel and so on or RISC-V, they actually have their own support layers as well supporting that. And then you have things like Zephyr, there's a meta Zephyr layer we are using to build that. And then all these things are getting basically put together like different small Lego blocks, uh, blocks here. And then you can build up your, your product or your, your final thing. Um, that is actually one of the things I was wondering about when coming here and doing the slides. Um, is there any interest from, from your side to get engaged in any, any of these? So maybe working together with us, building a meta Riot OS layer that would use the Riot OS build system. I heard that you switch over to Kconfig or Kconfig is available, for example. That could be an option to have like overlays or have like fragments that can actually make it more modular to get things working together. That you have like board support, maybe even hooked into like a way that it can get parts passed out of the actual build system. Um, so for what we did for Zephyr, for example, we have like Vest as a building tool, and you could ask Vest for like what kind of boards are supported, what is like the chipsets and so on, the architectures and so on. And from there we can generate the board support files that we need in in Yocto to actually build something. Um, we would like to use something like that and then bring it together with all the other Yocto two chains and so on that we already have um, and tie it all together with like supported devices, applications you can build with like, with like special examples, recipes called in, in Yocto speak. And then even things like flashing where you can have like flash integration for where we have like Python classes for like open OCD or JLink or whatever you want to have. So this is something so if you have interest in that, we can come back to that at the end of the talk um, or just talk to me. I'm only here today, but um, that might be interesting. The whole build process um, already started to talk started to talk, talk about that. So um, you install all the stuff you need for, for Bitbay, uh, Yocto basically, then you clone the repositories. And then we have like different build flavors. You would initialize the thing with, I come to that in a later slide as well. And then once you have set all of these up, then you like build your image and be able to flash it on your target or run it on QMO or whatever. And uh, there's a lot of things going into that. I don't go into all of these here, but you have like the obviously like source mirrors coming in. You have like configurations, patches, the BSP support maybe from your vendor and then policies on in the distro policies, how you want to do things. For example, we have a, a policy that our uh, root file system is read only. So we have like only very specific uh, parts that are mounted read write where things can be written into, but the rest of the system is read only on Linux, which is really helping on the security side because we only have like a few things we need to make sure that we, we audit and make sure that nothing is going wrong there. But these are like policy configurations you can, you can do in, in your closet. 
And then in the end, all of these things are getting compiled together. Um, and then you have like uh, packages are getting generated and from there getting the images and so on. So nothing, nothing too fancy or special here. So I started to talk about the, the build flavors we are having. And um, we can see here that when we initializing the build system, we are telling, um, we're telling Yocto that we want to have like a specific flavor. In this case, it's flavor Zephyr. And in this case, it's a flavor for Linux. And in the end, that really sets up all the things that are needed. That's the only difference. And from there, everything like two chain, how the things are integrated, what boards are available, what, what uh, image targets or image receives are available and so on. That's all taken care of at that point. And you would actually uh, go ahead and then set only, I want to use this like this machine. This is a, a Nordic uh, based uh, system from Arduino Nano or even something like the Raspberry Pi here. You know, so, and then you would build everything as, as you're used to. So these, these concepts of layers is sometimes a bit strange for people when they're starting out here, but I mean, you can really take it as like, like an onion as you normally do. You start with like the core layer um, where you have like policy decisions going in and so on. And then you have like uh, things around it, like matter of embedded where like specific build tools, development tools are sitting in to make everything working. Then you have like fusion layers like meta clung, for example, all of these things building, building on top of each other. So there are layer dependencies, make sure that you get that in. Um, so some of them might, if you have like a BSP layer coming in from STM, for example, they might have a dependency on meta arm just because they are like specific things they need from them and so on. And from there, you can build up on things. For, for us, it's like the, our core layer, distro policy and so on is the meta on your core. But then we go down and have like a, a tons of different things here. You can see here like meta seco, a meta intel, for example, for building for specific uh, targets. And then we have like for our integration with Open Harmony, we have like a dedicated layer for that. And here above here, you can see like for all the different artists that are supported in this layer system, this Zephyr, Free Artist, and Meta Lightos, and maybe Writers at some point. And yeah, the project itself was like, it's big and there's a lot of things going on and we are touching tons of stuff every day. So that means you need to make sure that everything kind of keeps working. I mean, obviously not everything will always keep working, but things like CI is helping us tremendously here. And we have like a, a big CI setup where we go through all of that. We have like metrics built for all kinds of uh, combinations of like the different boards we're having, the different tool chains we're having, the different uh, configuration options, at least the big ones we're having and so on going on there. Then we also have uh, not only compile time, but also runtime testing. That is the next slide about the Lava Lab we are running there. And all of this is also getting feed into the uh, what I mentioned before, like the um, IP checks and so on to make sure that we are able to like generate CVS checks on all the stuff we are building, uh, having like SBOM, like software BOM uh, bill of materials to make sure we have all the, the pieces correctly set up there. So uh, it's quite a lot of stuff around it, um, but again, not too different from what other projects are doing. I think, I think it's just more the, the scale of it, how we are putting that together that is interesting for, for partners. Yeah, so the lava, uh, so the testing, what we are doing is we have um, one of the partners having is Linaro and they're having like the lava based system. And what we are doing is like getting like the images we are creating from CI, getting them over, getting them boot tested and so on, making sure that these kinds are working. So basically like smoke testing, making sure everything is working there. Um, we also work on something that we call hardware lab as a service. So getting everything tied together, all the documentation, but also um, bill of materials, what you would need to bring your own hardware lab. Um, and we are deploying that at one of the testing companies we're working with, as well as one of the member companies that is interesting to have that in-house. And from there, they can hook up their own boards and so on to, to do the testing and everything. Yeah, so that is the, the part that is boring for a lot of people, but interesting for a lot of companies, the um, all the IP checking and so on. So we have like, all the stuff that comes in um, gets scanned for things like licenses, um, but not only like the license file as you would expect, but really going through the files, making sure what kind of headers are in there, what kind of specific uh, uh, um, license statements are in there. So for example, the when we started to scan Linux firmware, the, the package, it's like an interesting experience to see what kind of uh, 
license statements they have in there for the different files. I mean, you, yes, you can use it on this specific board under the circumstances, but if the moon is shining red or something. So it's really, there's a lot of stuff in there. And many, many of these things can be automated. So there are things like phosology, there are scan code and so on that can do a lot of the, the grind work, but you still need people with like domain experience to understand that and, and vet for it and make sure it's, it's working. So you have like um, a legal team working on that as well working on the, on the higher scale. So they are, they are experienced lawyers on the, on the license side, so they can look at that. But then we have also like auditors that go over every report and make sure this is working, this is working. And then you have things like in phosology where you can say, we reapply the decisions we have made on this specific packages before. And this is really something um, partners have been looking forward to because that is something they can base their own software bill of materials on and they can be confident to get that out. I know that is for Riot that might sound strange, but I know that other projects are working on producing SBOM files. That is something that could be interesting for Riot as well to provide that, to give like people using it a, a better idea of what's going on there. And um, when they're going to make a product after that, talk to their legal teams and make it easier to get that out. Yeah, so there's a lot of things we are trying to uh, be compliant to and work on the standards and so on. Uh, yeah, no surprise here. I mentioned most of that already. So Open Harmony and Yocto, SPDX is the, um, for the SBOM files and Open Chain is like the whole process around it, like how you're building that up. Reuse is also a way of like how you um, identify licenses in your files if you have whatever, you have like an image file, um, a graphical image asset or something in your build process. There's no license attached to that or something. So you can have like an extra file describing that and then the software can automatically detect that and so on. That, that's good. And then on the Linux side, we have also things like um, system ready for like secure boot stuff and so on. So that's also uh, quite interesting. But we also have like technical stuff, which I think is interesting uh, between like Onero and what Riot was doing, at least from, from my perspective, coming from the connectivity domain. One thing I've been working on last year, uh, it was like getting a blueprint out for, for our partners to understand and maybe use uh, later on as like um, for a turnkey solution with, with OpenSwift. So the idea was to have like this small Arduino um, nano device with a Nordic chipset to have allow that one to have like full IP connectivity and make sure we can they can use it with a coin cell battery and then operate as a sensor or whatever, right? That, that could be could be everything. But they don't want it to deal with all kind of like onboarding and like how they're doing the key uh, stuff and so on. We didn't have that. So they want to have like a, um, a turnkey solution. So that is where OpenSwift came in here at that point. Um, so we could like get all of that integrated on the Linux side as a border router. And on the Zephyr side, we did uh, the OpenSwift as a node. And then you even have things like the, the mobile application to do like the onboarding, the QR code and stuff like that. So this was like a blueprint getting out. Um, again, this is something that is existing already. It's more like making everything ready and consumable by, by a partner or other people working on that. Um, I'm also looking into Matter, uh, which is like uh, the formerly product connected home of IP project. There's an open source SDK they're working on. Um, hopefully they're going to have a re-release this, this year. And then that is something I'm also looking forward to um, see what we can do with that, uh, how useful it is and what we can do with that. Um, but yeah, uh, right now we're also working on, on other blueprints um, that are for example, using co-op. So we're using um, at least in two or three blueprints we're having, we're using co-op um, with a resource directory to like um, announce the resources, make sure that we can register them, filter them, get all the stuff back. And that is also one of the parts where we look into like having the distributed as, uh, resource aspect where we can go ahead and find all the resources, making them virtual resources that can be used by all the different nodes in the network and so on. So this is where we, we also use this co-op in here. And as the um, former speaker from Zuka already mentioned, OTA, always coming up um, when, when a partner asks about it. And our solution so far is have, uh, on the Linux side have this OTA that's a component we are developing ourselves that is sitting on top of RAUC, which is an open source project that is already there. Um, that is, we are using that for AB updates and so on. And on the Zephyr side, we are looking uh, to do the same with MCU boot has been mentioned here as well. I had no idea about a Riot boot to be honest. Um, so that's something we might want to look into as well. And uh, about all the like, how you're hosting that, how the fleet management around it and so on. We are looking into Hogbit, um, which is 
also an interesting experience. I mean, Bosch is um, doing quite some work there. Um, it's also on our clips, so that's also helping us to like work together with them. But again, there's like the difference between what Bosch is offering to their customers and what is the open source project. And we have to see what kind of features are supported and we want to have and so on. So this is um, always like a, a juggle to, to get that all sorted out. And that uh, would be everything I have so far. So I would uh, love to have uh, comments and remarks and so on. So as I said, if anybody is interested in like to see how to integrate that or not, um, talk to me, talk to me now, ask questions or um, I'm around all day today and then I will go on. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Baron, for this talk. Are there any questions from, from the audience, any comments? Anyone who immediately says, I want to do uh, a neural integration for Rust? <laughs> <laughs> that would be surprising, I should say. Maybe not that. Uh, but, but I saw you also mentioned uh, so hmm. how, have, how much you work through those protocols. Like, do you know about is, is it documented uh, somewhere? Yes, so, um, okay, so if you go for mesh, and, so meta is like, is IP level, right? So meta is like, would sit on top of, of thread in that point or Wi-Fi or whatever. So I, I rule that out. I mean, yes, mesh would, uh, meta would like have like its own, own onboarding and like bring all the like security and um, key material in. But if you go for, for thread for 15.4 only, they're using the normal 15.4 um, uh, mechanics for like AS encryption on uh, link layer and so on. So they're using that. What they bring in is like how you do all the key rotation and stuff like that, generating the material. So for that, there are like, uh, they have some security white papers, but also the thread 1.1 specification that is available. You can, even without being a member, you can, you can get that. Um, I don't think the newest ones are uh, available, but I'm not, so uh, my company is also not part, no member of the thread group. So, um, but you can also look at all the open source implementations. So that is really helpful to have. Um, I mean, that, that is working well. Um, so for my side, that is um, way better than the plain 15.4. So that's what I'm normally coming from. And there you have nothing. You have to like bring your own, uh, how you distribute the keys and so on. So that is like, yeah. And for the mesh stuff, um, they have like different, um, IP prefixes for the different mesh uh, support and then they have different routes that are going there. So, but not too, not too different from what you would expect. So, do you disagree with that? Yeah. Also, <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, we can, I don't know how much you wanted to go into the details here, but okay. Some questions over here. So I saw your CI are um, running testing um, for d different builds. So um, I, I, I'm keen. I'm, I'm keen in understanding uh, how do how do you do the runtime testing for MCUs. So do you use uh, a uh, for infrastructure for? I mean, do you have a hardware infra infrastructure environment for that, or do you use a virtual simulation like Renode? So we, we have both. So we have like we have QMO like. For the, like the for the smoke testing, but then we have real hardware lab where the systems are sitting, and then it's like the device on the test. And then you have like in Raspberry Pi, for example, getting all the control over the device, and then you have like all the wires set up so you can flash it directly and get like all the feedback back and so on. So that's a full uh, device on a test setup. That's the like the hardware lab as a service, as I mentioned there. That would really sit in a rack, and then all the stuff get get pulled there, and then flash can be tested. Um, is the Linux Foundation involved in the project? No. <laughs> no, it's a it's a, it's an Eclipse Foundation project. So um, it's hosted there, and so Linux Foundation. I mean, obviously there are things that they are working on that we are working on. Um, I mean, it's it's all like the all the open source components you're pulling together, but it's not a Linux Foundation project. Yeah, thanks for the yeah. really interesting talk. Like. Um, <clears throat> Can you maybe it's a difficult answer to uh, to give, but like, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the Harmony OS and like uh, oh, again, I didn't... Har Harmony and like what's the goal of Harmony uh, for 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 Huawei and like 
part how it really differentiates with yeah. like uh on you know open harmony like i i it, you skimmed over it like um you, you, can you just give a few just a few more things i mean i don't know about the others uh i know very little about it like yeah. if, if there's anything kind of uh that you can say about it that, that would be interesting to describe i guess so how many os i mean we this one is not an open source project so that's i'm not really involved in any of that um but i mean there was a need to have like their own their own system to get something out to get supported for all the devices so um normally you have like if you go mobile you have like ios and android right but if you go for like embedded or appliances or stuff like that it's you, you normally can't use that or you want to have something else and um i worked for a another big company before starting with an S and they had also had their own operating system for all the appliances and so on. So that's, it, it seems to be a very natural path for like these big companies to, to bring that up. Obviously, a lot of that is about control, but it's also like about like fitting their, uh, fitting their needs and making sure that that is working well for them. Um, so that is where how many US is, but as I said, it's very focused on, on China, on the Chinese market. Um, and we don't really have any of like, the big requirements coming from them. So we have like a good good way of freedom where we could say, okay, we, we talk with the partners here and figure out what they really want and, and try to build up on that. But still the aim is uh, still to be compatible to like what Open Harmony has here. But again, Open Harmony, not Harmony OS. So make sure that we can leverage that out. And then hopefully, um, but that's a few years down the road that have like applications being portable between the two of them and so on. That is the idea, but that's a lot of work to get that all worked out. So. And I propose we um, move all other discussions and uh, questions to the coffee break um, now. Thanks again, Stefan, for this um, interesting talk. And uh, then the next session will start um, at four, the networking session, if I remember correctly. Thanks a lot to all the speakers.